China's ambitions in space received a boost over the weekend as three astronauts docked at China's semi-finished space station. Tiangong is expected to be fully ready by the end of the year. But China's ambitions don't end there. There are plans to collect samples from asteroids by 2025, launch a manned mission to the moon by 2029, and explore Jupiter, among other missions. The country's space program has accelerated under President Xi Jinping, and the message is clear. The sky is not the limit. Three of the biggest celebrities of the moment in China. Two veteran taikonauts and one rookie were greeted by waving flags and military honors before their Sunday morning launch time. The scene similar to those for the Soviet Union's Sputnik cosmonauts and American Mercury astronauts in the 1950s and 60s, all deemed heroes by their governments. The Chinese are playing catch-up but they're blasting through decades of progress and gaining ground in a hurry. The dramatic launch of the rocket Long March 2F from the edge of the Gobi Desert was seen by millions. Within seven hours, the crew aboard the rocket's Shenzhou-14 capsule was docking with the center part of the space station, which Taikonauts are due to complete by the end of the year. We've entered the core module, and next month we'll see the arrival of Wenqian and later the Mengqian laboratory modules. We'll then complete the construction of our own space station, our home in space. China's future home in space underpins its ambitions to become a space superpower alongside the United States and Russia. It's already become the first country to land a rover vehicle on the far side of the moon and a rover on Mars. I hope the Communist Party of China and the people can rest assured about our six-month mission. China is building its own space station because it's excluded from the International Space Station. That mostly due to U.S. pressure on its partners. The American-led ISS is likely to operate until 2030, and after that, China's space station could well be the preeminent laboratory in low Earth orbit. And joining me now for more is Dr. Mark Hilborn from King's College London. He's a lecturer in the Defence Studies Department and has written about China's space programme. Dr. Hilborn, what is the ambition, you think, that's driving China's space plans? I mean, is it strategic competition or a pursuit of science? Um, I think we could argue it's probably a mixture of both, and, and that's probably not unusual for any nation, really. There's value in conducting purely scientific endeavours, these could be general of general value in themselves, but they also help build co cooperation and understanding between states. There's co commercial value. There's a lot of money to be made in space. We're seeing a you know the commercial sector now is worth 400 billion dollars globally, and growing. Um, but also military. Uh, that's another uh, goal. Quite obviously, one of the troubles with space is dual use technology makes distinguishing military and non military functions very hard. Um, so we can probably argue that it's a combination of, of all of these things. Um, and through closer cooperation with other states, it can then increase its diplomatic sort of influence in establishing and shaping uh, global governance, for instance, something we've seen happening. There's a lot of discussion at the UN. Uh, the UK right. recently tabled a, a, a recent resolution. This is the result of uh, diplomatic good standing, and it generates further good standing. So China will be looking to do probably all of these things. Uh, but how much does China's space program actually help China, at least in the civilian sphere of things? Well, there's a number of functions now that, you know, we see uh, utility from in terms of both civilian and, and commercial aspects of space. Commercially, there's money to be made um, quite clearly from all kinds of things like ground mapping and, and communications, but that can add um, to the quality of life generally uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the average Chinese citizen. Um, there's, there's, there's diplomatic, uh, domestic diplomatic agendas too. It, it helps, I think, increase the position of the CCP within in China's cit citizenry, um, generating that um, position and justification for the, the Communist Party as well. So there's a number, a number of domestic reasons international political reasons, but also military reasons um, as well. We think about the benefits in, in terms of operating in space. 
Right. You spoke about uh, dual-use technology in terms of both civilian and military uses uh, of, uh, of space. Is that what particularly uh, concerns uh, countries when it comes to China, potentially also because of the lack of transparency uh, when it comes to China's space plans? There is that. So inherently, space is dual use. So everything from launch vehicles, to the satellites, to the, the data and services they create can be used for, for both audiences. And as you say, um, it's very difficult to understand what China's objectives um, actually are. It's rather opaque in terms of its decision making. So that dual use element is quite problematic when we're looking at space generally and identifying what, say, is military and what is not military, and very particularly problematic when we're looking at China. So that is that does raise concerns. Space is a very sensitive area um, for a number of military and non-military reasons. And so if any uh, actor is operating in space without any sort of form of transparency, that creates a lot of concerns um, generally. You spoke about uh, cooperation with other countries. Is that really happening with China's space program? I mean, for instance, it has been excluded from cooperation on the International Space Station. That's right. Traditionally, China, in terms of military and, and non-military aspects, hasn't benefited from alliances such as NATO or, or the, the Five Eyes alliances. So it has been somewhat isolated in many respects in that way. In terms of space, though, we're seeing increasing cooperation with Russia. Now, that cooperation goes back to the Soviet era, the beginning of China's missile and space program, has a lot of right. Soviet um, DNA. But increasingly, we're seeing cooperation in two specific areas with Russia, and that's in the global navigation satellite systems, so GLONASS and Beidou, and also ballistic missile early warning. Right. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a certain synergy to be created there. Um, if we think about, so the, the GLONASS system has slightly better coverage in the northern hemisphere, China slightly better in the south. Um, by creating ground stations in each other's countries, they can increase the resilience and accuracy of some right. of their signals. Um, similarly, too, that, that reciprocal um, kind of ground stations can benefit ballistic missile early warning, and Russia is committed to helping China build a space-based missile warning system, putting sensors in space. So I think, you know, we often see China as having the greater technological know-how in space and maybe more generally, but we can't forget that, that Russia has a great deal of operational experience in space. And so there's very right. fruitful areas of cooperation there. But it is, as you say, quite limited in terms of China, and that's, it doesn't have that outreach that, say, the U.S. or Western states have. Right. We leave it there uh, for today. But thank you so much for joining us on this, Dr. Mark Hilburn from King's College London. Thank you so much.